So uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome here to the ECB and to, to Frankfurt, uh, to those in the room, and also to our online audience who are, are joining us from all around the world. Um, so yeah, a big warm welcome to this, the fifth joint uh, European Central Bank, um, Bank of Canada and Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, joint conference on expectation surveys. The theme of this year's conference is expectation surveys, central banks, and the economy. And I'm really delighted um, to uh, now give the floor to European Central Bank uh, Vice President Louis de Guindos, who is going to provide the opening speech for the conference. Vice President, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this fifth joint conference on expectation surveys organized by the ECB, the Bank of Canada, and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. In my remarks today, I will delve into the world of uh, expectation surveys and their relevance to central banks. I will review how useful expectation surveys have proven to be for central banks over the period since 2019, the year we held our first conference in this series. In addition, I will touch on the challenges facing central banks in using surveys. The fact that central banks generally operate under great uncertainty has come to the fore over the past five years. Today, too, we are facing huge uncertainty, not least in view of the many prevailing economic, financial, and geopolitical risks. Yet, it is precisely in this unpredictable and highly complex landscape that surveys have come into their own. Over the past decade, central banks and other policy-making institutions have invested significantly in expectation surveys and have drawn increasingly on survey data for their policy analysis and research. These surveys cover consumers, consumers, firms, financial market participants, and other experts, including professional forecasters. At the ECB, we can fortunately look at a wide array of such, of such surveys covering diverse topics such as consumer expectations, household finance and consumption, access to finance of enterprises, the payment attitudes of consumers, and finally, bank lending. Since 2013, the ECB has also conducted a survey of wholesale market participants on credit terms and conditions, and it recently developed a new survey of monetary analysts to collect expert expectations about key monetary policy parameters and concepts. Finally, the ECB's survey of professional forecasters was launched back in 1999 at the start of economic and monetary union. All ECB surveys can provide insights into how different economic agents form and update their expectations. They can reveal the potential biases in these expectations and to the extent to which expectations fit into economic decisions. Surveys were indeed quite central to the economic debate in the 50s and the 60s, but the role became more marginal when rational expectations were incorporated into economic modeling in the 70s. Over the past 10 years, however, economists have, have surveyed expectations clearly returning to the mainstream. One could describe the recent growth in survey-based uh, research as a counter-revolution following the early revolution centered on rational expectations. Today, while models based on rational expectations still form a useful reference point in our analysis and research, they are no longer thought to provide a solid basis for understanding business cycles for gauging the risk of financial crisis or for designing effective economic policies. The central insight gained from this new line of survey-based research is that many economic agents may systematically perform expectations by using partial sets of information or by following subjective narratives about how the economy functions. It is important to understand such uh, subjective expectations because these beliefs often underlie the economic choices and financial decisions that drive the economy. Surveys have repeatedly proven their usefulness over the past five years. During the COVID-19 pandemic, they were especially useful in helping to track financial conditions 
for firms and households, as well as in estimating the labour market response to the pandemic shock. For example, the ECB's Consumer Expectation Survey, an online survey that, which was uh, launched in early 2020, helped us uh, to understand the severity of the pandemic-induced collapse in consumption and gauge the overall effectiveness of the major policy interventions by governments and other authorities at the time. More recently, the data collected in surveys strongly supported the analysis of the recent inflationary episode in the euro area. During the early phase of the inflation surge in 2022, survey data helped to inform the central discussion on the likely persistence of the shock. For example, the observed increase in consumers' medium-term expectations may have interacted with an increase in firms' pricing power to make the original supply shocks more persistent than they would otherwise have been. Forces that would gradually help bring inflation back down to our target were also visible in more recent survey data. For example, we could see how the rise in inflation and inflation expectations was acting as a major constraint on demand and consumer spending owing to its impact on real incomes. In August 2023, respondents of, to the ECB's Consumer Expectation Survey were asked what actions they were planning to take in light of their expectations about future inflation. The results clearly showed that a much higher share of consumers plan to reduce their spending in response to the expectations of higher prices. In addition, consumers indicated that they would start to shop around more and buy cheaper varieties of goods and services than they normally would. These behavioral responses to, to higher inflation expectations were influenced by decisive monetary policy an action, uh, policy action aimed at restoring price stability and clearly contributed to the gradual unwinding of the inflationary pressures across the euro area economy. In addition to monetary policy, expectation surveys are now increasingly being used for the other central bank uh, tasks as well. This includes financial stability analysis. Here, surveys can help identify potential sources of financial risk, not only in financial markets and the banking system, but also in the household and non-financial corporate sectors. Even when there is no discernible financial stress at the, great, ag the aggregate level, the disaggregated or individual level data typically provided by surveys can help us to identify emergency risks across particular sectors or socio-demographic groups. In financial stability analysis, the topic of financial literacy is receiving increased attention. In the first keynote lecture of the conference, Professor Anna, Professor Anna Maria Lusardi from Stanford University will talk about why financial literacy is relevant for central banks. One consideration for financial stability analysis is that less financially literate households may be less prepared to cope with adverse economic and financial shocks. Policies seeking, seeking to boost financial literacy may help borrowers to source loans that are cheaper to service thus promoting more efficient and more sustainable debt management. These issues may be particularly relevant for real estate markets and housing, which will be the focus of the second keynote lecture of the conference given by Professor Tarun Ramadorai from Imperial College London. Our experiences with survey data also highlight the challenges that policymakers face when using this data. Survey data can be volatile, and there is evidence of our reaction in both household, household and firm surveys of expectations. For this reason, surveys may provide a noisy signal for policy making in practice, which uh, complicates how this data should fit into the, police, into the policy reaction function in this respect. I hope the research presented at today's conference can also help policymakers distinguish the signal from the noise that is always embedded in expectation data. These considerations underline the importance of the quality of the survey design, including the sampling and the data collection methods. As central banks are making increasingly use of survey data, they need to continuously and carefully monitor this data to ensure responses remain representative of the underlying population's beliefs and behavior. Let me conclude. Today's expectation surveys are an important part of the toolkit available to central banks for their policy analysis. These surveys reveal insights about the economy that would otherwise remain hidden for, from, from view. 
As a result, they can contribute to more robust policy decisions and better policy assessments. I would like to finish by thanking the presenters and participants in advance for their contributions and the conference organizers for putting together such a good program. I wish you all uh, a productive and successful two days of lively debate and discussions. I am confident that the insights that will emerge from sharing our experience will ultimately enhance the way in which we use expectation surveys to help guide policy decisions. Thank you very much.